Hello everyone. At the end of 2020, OMFIF published the Future of Payments report, which takes stock, describes and evaluates the current payments industry, including services offered and the infrastructure to support them. The study highlights the key trends and innovations that are likely to shape the future, ways in which people will pay, save and transfer value domestically and across borders. Today, I am pleased to be joined by one of the contributors to this important piece of research, Pietro Grassano, uh, Business Solutions Director at Algorand. He will share and discuss some of the findings and give us Algorand's perspectives as to how the future of payments is shaping up. Welcome, Pietro, and thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure. Hello. I have three questions for you. Uh, firstly, we saw COVID-19's impact cause massive changes in the payments behavior towards a digital means of payment. This is only one of the contributing trends uh, towards a more digital world. Mobile money providers, banks and payment service providers are always looking for greater innovation in payments. From your perspective, how is the payments uh, space progressing? What are the key trends we are we seeing? And who has the most influential stake, who has who have been the most influential stakeholders in the current state of play in payments? Well, I think that uh, you're right. Uh, the COVID crisis actually gave a sort of opportunity of rethinking a little bit uh, uh, the landscape uh, in payment, uh, uh, which is uh, at the end of the day, an infrastructure, a piece of infrastructure that has been uh, through history undergoing many changes, right? From uh, uh, metal coins to paper money uh, to electronic money. Uh, we can also think that perhaps uh, uh, double entry bookkeeping uh, is a sort of technology, right? And it's an infrastructure for uh, uh, exchange uh, that uh, actually started to exist uh, at a certain point in time. Uh, and history moves actually in by discrete steps. Uh, and uh, this could be one of those. Uh, the things that we are seeing is uh, an announced use uh, of uh, a digital form of payments. Uh, no wonder you have uh, lots of transactions that are happening. The more and more in the digital world, uh, lots of assets are brought in the digital world uh, in various shapes and forms. Uh, digital representation of assets uh, uh, can be very creative. Uh, you can think of uh, traditional assets being uh, digitally represented. You can think of uh, new types of assets, data, for instance, uh, becoming an asset in the digital world. No wonder payments have to follow somehow the same type of routes. And if you think of uh, uh, the payment as an infrastructure for uh, the exchange of value at the end of the day, uh, I think that the stakeholders that are mostly influential in the payments landscape uh, are, if you want, uh, fall in the categories of the influentials in any type of infrastructure, be it roads, motorways, railways, the internet, right? It's uh, essentially the technology providers. And uh, in payments, I can think of traditional finance players, banks, for instance, being part of the technology providers institutions setting up the rules for the use of the infrastructure, and then of course the users, without which an infrastructure doesn't become an infrastructure. These are the true influential stakeholders. So if the users uh, start to, I don't know, be fearful of uh, the use of cash because uh, of COVID, for instance, uh, well, they just uh, will amplify a trend that was already ongoing, uh, uh, having many purchases happening in the digital world institutions uh, will have to give the rules uh, for this to happen uh, in a regulated manner and technology somehow will need to enable this uh, new trend. Thank you Pietro. Central banks are entering, entering this retail digital payments more often than not being forced into both understanding the risks, ensuring consistency in regulatory compliance, building or collaborating in their own space. What are the key motivations and use cases for a central bank issued digital currency and how could this impact incumbents and what are the benefits for end users here? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if central banks uh, uh, have been somehow forced or not. Uh, historically, even the, 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 the role of central banks have been somehow shaken and moved through time by seismic changes and there is a lot of literature about that. 
Um, in, in our case, I think that uh, geopolitical and geoeconomical uh, factors have been uh, uh, somehow uh, pushing or just giving the opportunity to central banks to refine their thinking. And uh, um, you can think of uh, some initiatives uh, from China, for instance. You can think of some initiatives from the private sectors that somehow, uh, I mean, the birth of global stable coins at a certain point uh, questions, obliges central banks to pose some questions about uh, what kind of uh, ability to uh, manage the monetary policy. Uh, they, 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 they will have in the future. Um, all this, I think, is a very lively uh, arena in which you have uh, many different uh, perspectives. Uh, uh, some central banks look uh, at the subject from the perspective of financial inclusion, namely those of uh, uh, most of uh, um, emerging markets, uh, some others uh, uh, in developed markets uh, uh, look at it uh, in terms of uh, things that can be made available uh, with uh, a mean of exchange uh, of the same nature of the economy that is more and more digital, right? Uh, so I think that there are reasons that are very deep. Uh, and uh, the two things that seems to me more appealing for uh, the central banks are on one end uh, the logic of the financial inclusion and on the other end uh, the fact that uh, you can think of programmable money uh, in a world where exchanges can be programmable. Um, at the end of the day we are keep on seeing situations where the information flows uh, with a speed that is a multiple of the speed uh, of the uh, infrastructure for value exchange. And this leads to situations where you have market manipulations, uh, where you have uh, loss of rationality in the allocation uh, from specific uh, economic agents, perhaps given a way to have economical exchange with the same speed of information is what we need. Central banks state that they are technology agnostic and allow their policy objectives to dictate design and technology decisions when it comes to issuing CBDC. Uh, so to put simply, does the technology matter here at all? Uh, what key features and requisites does any payments technology, whether blockchain or other, need to meet such as speed, resiliency, cost efficiency and so on? Sure. Uh, well, I think that uh it's it's right to be technology agnostic until you find the, the technology that solves the problem that you want to solve uh, and so i mean as a starting point uh, i i fully appreciate it uh, uh, i think though that uh, uh, the type of technology you choose and pick uh, will uh, determine uh, the ability to be attuned with uh, the future of economy and of finance so it's not uh, a, 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 an easy task, an easy decision, because uh, it, it matters a lot. Uh, for instance, the deciding uh, to go for the centralized systems or centralized system is going to be a, a, something that uh, will have uh, important consequences uh, in terms of accessibility, in terms uh, of uh, inclusion. Um, I think that the most important criteria here uh, should be the one of uh, thinking of a financial system and a payment system that uh, is not uh, a walled garden, but is more uh, an open system that uh, will nurture innovation and the ability to think of new business models, because the old ones, uh, we've been using them since a long, long time. So it's the right moment to, to be pretty creative. At the end of the day, Technology matters because, uh, uh, like in every infrastructure, it allows uh, to solve a specific problem in an effective manner. I don't know, for roads moving from point A to point B, for uh, uh, economic exchange uh, to be scalable. No? In the blockchain world, we talk about scalability. At the end of the day, scalability is efficiency in the value exchange. Uh, another feature of all infrastructure has to be accessible. It's true for bridges, roads, railways, and the internet. If it's not accessible, it's not a real infrastructure. And uh, it's the same also for 
the infrastructure of value exchange. It has to be somehow accessible, have some forms of decentralization due to that. And then it has to be secure, like roads, like railways, and so on, right? Again, uh, security will have to be a feature. So technical features of scalability, of decentralization, accessibility, and security cannot be disregarded. Thank you, Pietro, uh, for your comprehensive answers and sharing your insights with us. To download the report, please visit our website on screen or follow the link in the description. Thank you.